Through ragginess in anime are not something that are too uncommon. I mean, there are characters in any series that are just as important as the protagonist of that series. Now, these terms are usually used for characters that are introduced right after the protagonist of that series. Now, one thing that you oftentimes see specifically when you're watching anime series is that usually the protagonist is usually a male character. That's not to say there isn't any females, but the majority of times is usually a very small portion. And in today's video, I want to talk about the best female derogonists there are in anime as i was able to find good examples as to how to create a great female derogonist in anime now a quick warning as some of these characters are going to contain a lot of spoilers of things that happen to them in their own stories so if you're a person who hasn't watched any of the series that involves some of these characters then you have been warned as this is going to contain a few spoilers so now that's out of the way let's start with a character that's from one of my favorite series of all time and that is susan a Horror Kita from Classroom of the Elite, a girl who thought that just being by herself and working things on her own would be the way into getting into class A. However, she would be proven wrong by not just her brother, but also another character, and this being the main protagonist himself, Kiyotaka Ayanakoji. Horikita as a deuterogonist was really interesting to see because at first not many people including myself were huge fans of her character. It was very clear she was very arrogant, simple minded and her attitude towards the main protagonist and as well as the other characters of the series didn't make things much better but apart from what was showing on the outside, on the inside things were a completely different story as Horikita did have somebody that she deeply cared about and wanted to prove to them that she was somebody valuable and that is none other than her brother Man Anabu Horikita, in which in just a few interactions, we can clearly see that the relationship between Horikita and her brother is not the greatest. And the reason being is because Horikita believes that the reason why her brother doesn't like her is because she is not as talented as he is, when later on we will find out that her brother doesn't outright hate her, but he wishes that she didn't have to follow his shadow and try to be just like him, and instead try to be her own person. Which he isn't the only one that is thinking of this, but also Ayana Koji who he sees a lot of potential in Horikita, but due to her trying to follow her brother's shadow, she is basically wasting her potential. And throughout the story, we see Ayana Koji trying to change Horikita's mindset and how she views certain things for the better. And while it did take a while, and of course it wasn't as easy as to convince her to change her viewpoints, ultimately Horikita will slowly realize that both Ayana Koji and her brother were trying to make her a better person and see that working alone was not the way to get into class A and that she needed to work with other people in order to achieve the goal that she wants which is getting into class A. And despite Horikita taking pretty much an entire year of her first year of high school to realize this, after this the next year, this being the second year, she would not only try and work with other people during special exams, but also not be closed minded and instead open minded hearing what other people have to say, not just about her, but trying to use that as examples to improve herself more and more as the school year goes on. And this will ultimately lead her to become the leader of the class, just showing how far she has gotten. We went from someone who said that she didn't need people around her to now being the leader of the entire class, making the decisions and making sure that they pass the exams no matter what. What? And because Classroom of the Elite is still ongoing, we will just have to wait and see what she does next as the story continues. But Horikita isn't the only example of making a great female derogatorist as the next one would be none other than Sagiri from Hell's Paradise, in which her character actually accomplishes two things. One, how to write a great female derogatorist for a story, but also showing us how to write a great strong female character that isn't cringy and becomes a very hateable character. That is not the case with Sagiri. Sagiri Sagiri is from the Yamara clan, a clan that specializes on executing criminals, and Sagiri is one of these executioners. However, based on the time period that Hell's Paradise takes place, Sagiri is ridiculed by other members of the Yamara clan to not be an executioner because some members believe that the role of a woman in the Yamara clan is just simply to get married and make kids. However, Sagiri was very quick to prove to us that this is not the lifestyle that she wanted to have. And no matter what people say to her, and no matter how much ridicule she has to deal with, with she is going to stay as an executioner 
Now, this is not to say that Sagri didn't have any character development in the Hell's Paradise series, as she will quickly come to realize that just because someone is a criminal, that doesn't mean that they always wanted to be a criminal, and how some criminals are still human, and it's very clear that not all of them are just people who are just pure evil. And she was greatly shown this with Gabimaru, the protagonist of Hell's Paradise, in which she realized that the only reason why Gabimaru did the crimes he did was because he was part of a clan that made him a killing machine. But deep down, he still has emotions and he has feelings for somebody that is very special to him and that is none other than his wife but not only that but also due to the circumstance that they are in this being in an island that is filled with a bunch of mysterious creatures in order to retrieve an item known as the elixir of life Sagari is very also quick to realize that not everyone is going to make it alive in this island and that many of her comrades are not going to be able to see another day and even though it's hard for her in the beginning to accept this with a few words of the other characters in the series Sagari realizes that they do have a point that they all knew what they were signing up for when going into this island and they knew how dangerous it would be once they were in this island and i think these moments in hell's paradise just greatly show us that while sagri is a strong person she is still human she still has emotions and she still feels bad whenever somebody that she deeply cares or knew for a really long time is no longer by her side not to mention that sagri isn't some sort of love interest for gabimaru that is one thing i forgot to mention as well is that the author knew how to write sagri as a character sure as the time goes on both gabimaru and sagri are able to get to know each other more deeply but just because they started to know each other more that doesn't mean that they started to develop feelings between each other the first reason is very obvious and that's because he has a wife and he has made it very clear that he only is paying attention to his wife and not any other women around him the second reason is because Sagri and Garimaru are a great example of how a male character and a female character don't need to have any romantic feelings between each other in order to form some sort of relationship between each other. And with these reasons alone, it's no wonder why so many people not only consider Sagri one of the best characters of Hell's Paradise, but also one of the best recent examples of a female derogonist done right. Now getting into the isekai genre, there is a good examples of great female characters, but the one female Derogonist that I feel like is worth talking about is none other than Emilia from ReZero. At first, many people believed that Emilia was just simply going to be the love interest of the main protagonist Subaru. And if you're an anime watcher, you would know that in season one, there weren't really a lot of moments that really captivated a lot of people to say that Emilia was one of the best characters of ReZero. But that would all completely change during season two, in which we got to learn more about Emilia as a character. Not only did we find out about her tragic backstory. Story and what happened to her at a very young age but we also come to find out that Emilia really has a lot of troubles loving herself which may not seem like a big deal to some people but you have to keep in mind that this is also a very similar issue that Subaru the protagonist also deals on in the series how he also has troubles loving himself and not being able to see the positives in him that is something that Emilia also faces and it's something that is not very easy to get over with and this makes more sense once we see just how bad Emilia can get once she becomes completely broken but things will turn for the better once she comes to realize that there will always be one person that will always be with her no matter what no matter what she is facing or what she is dealing with in her own self there is somebody that's always going to be with her to give her the support she needs and this is of course none other than Subaru in which despite him having to deal with his own problems he is making sure to make Amelia realize that she is not going to be alone and she will never be alone from now on after hearing all this we see a sudden change in Amelia she not only starts to love herself more now but she also starts to let go of the past that was always haunting her making her not be able to move forward but once she hears Subaru's words she now is determined to let go of everything that happened in the past in order to focus on the future so while yes Amelia is still considered to be the love interest of the protagonist she had her own character arc in which it not only focused on her inner struggles about herself but we also saw a side of her that we didn't get to see earlier on in the series but i'm glad in this part of the story it did show us that amelia wasn't just the typical love interest of the protagonist but a character that had her moments of not just impacting the story but also impacting the viewer as well and then we have Takina from Lycoris Recoil in which at first during the beginning of the anime original series 
talking that lacked emotion and seemed to have no idea what's the point of close relationships with people. Not to mention that at such a young age, she was also a part of an organization known as DA that focused on taking down terrorists that could bring a lot of danger and harm to the city that she is at. But because Takina was always determined to complete her missions no matter what, some of the things she would do would be too risky and as a result of this, one day she would not only do something that would risk herself but also risk the other members of the DA which resulted in Takina now having to be relocated at a different base, this being a cafe that seems like a normal cafe but is actually a disguise and is part of the DA organization. And in this cafe, she will meet somebody that will change her life completely and that is Chisaro who was the complete opposite of Takina as she was very cheerful and outgoing and was also very positive at pretty much anything. Now at first Takina didn't really understand why Chisaro was the way she was, didn't see the point in how Chisaro was living her life. But as they got more closer and as they spent more time with each other, Takina would realize that Chisaro was somebody that she deeply cared for. Which was why she was devastated when she found out that Chisaro had a very limited amount of time to live as her heart was very fragile and she required a different heart in order to live longer. Here we see Takina now realizing why people value their relationships with other people. It's not just because they want to but because these people are so important to them that if anything happens to them they will be devastated and that's how Takina felt in these moments when she found out what was happening with Chisaro. Which just greatly shows the amount of character development she got in this series as if this is the old Takina. She wouldn't have been this emotional or this impacted upon hearing this news. And towards the end of the series, we see Takina trying desperately to save Chisaro's life by getting rid of the man that actually had another heart that could save Chisaro's life. However, this person was somebody that meant a lot to Chisaro. So because of this, Chisaro prevented Takina from killing this man in order to get the heart. And here we see a moment in which Takina, who was considered to be a cold killing machine is going back to her roots not just because she wanted to but because she believed that this was necessary in order to save the person that gave her life colors which just simply made Takina just a very powerful character in this series and even though towards the end Chisaro does survive and is able to get another heart to keep on living they both acknowledge that there's still more to come but they both also acknowledge that just them simply being together for now is all that really matters. Takina is a great example of how an anime original character can be just as powerful and as impactful to the story as a character from a manga series or a light novel. And of course it's not just Takina but also just the entirety of Lycoris Recoil that really show us that anime originals can be a good thing and if done right they can make stories that are just as good as any other series. Now going back to the shonen genre, there is a character that is actually quite the opposite of Sagiri from Hell's Paradise. But despite all that, she's still a very strong female derogonist and this is none other than Mikasa from Attack on Titan. I think it's very obvious that Attack on Titan doesn't need an introduction as it's one of the most iconic animes of all time. Mikasa is one of these characters that makes this series great. Now despite early on in the series showing us that Mikasa was obviously the love interest for the protagonist. Eren Yeager and everything she did was for Eren, she showed that she was still a badass and such a great character to see. Mikasa showed that she was somebody that you shouldn't mess with and whenever Eren wasn't around, she showed just how cold she can actually be to the people she considers as enemies. Now it's not like Mikasa's loyalty to Eren came out of nowhere, there's a reason why Mikasa is so loyal to Eren and that is because Eren saved her from a very terrible situation that involved a group of men not only killing her parents but also also kidnapping her as well but it will be Eren to not only save her but also get rid of these men for good and afterwards Mikasa would always try to make sure that she would be by Eren's side and she showed this very clearly when Eren wanted to join these scouts. Mikasa just simply joined the scouts just simply because Eren was there otherwise if Eren chose not to join she wouldn't have joined it whatsoever but this wouldn't be the only characteristics of Mikasa as even though she was loyal to Eren she would then have to prove just how loyal she would actually be to him as when Eren was having plans to commit genocide to the entire world and he was actually starting to do action with that plan Mikasa was very conflicted should she just simply stay by Eren's side and let him do what he pleases or realizing how wrong this is and how much tragedy this is going to cause but at the same time while she was conflicted there was always something that she was strongly against whenever the other characters of the series 
always stated that if the worst scenario came that they had to kill Aaron because it was always there to reject that idea and always said that there has to be another solution to this entire problem. But towards the very end of AOT, Mikasa soon realizes that the only way to stop Aaron would be to kill him because Aaron made it very clear that he is not going to stop no matter what. That's exactly what will happen as Mikasa will be the one to finish Aaron off. And what makes this even more tragic is that Mikasa never really let go of Aaron. Mikasa would always visit Aaron's grave for the rest of her life. And when her time came and she was laid to rest, it would show that Mikasa always had her scarf wrapped around her, which is obviously the same scarf that Aaron gave to her when they were both kids, making it even more clear that Mikasa never forgot about Aaron and always kept the scarf that he gave her, making Mikasa such a tragic character as she was someone that was very loyal to somebody that she loved and she showed that to the very end. And, and that's why I really enjoy Mikasa's character in AOT. Yes, she was the love interest and yes, you could say that everything and every action she did was for Eren. All this really showed us just how much respect she had for Eren how she always wanted to be by his side no matter what. But just because she was loyal doesn't mean that she didn't have her own choices. How even though she still loved Eren, she still decided ultimately in the end that he had to be taken down to save all of humanity. Which, let's be honest, even towards the end, she could have easily not have done this and still let Eren do whatever he wanted to do, but she didn't let that happen. And lastly, we have to talk about none other than Ruby from Oshinoko. Now, Ruby is a very interesting female protagonist because even to this very day, in the most recent chapters, she's still getting a ton of character development. So I'm only going to talk about what's available right now because, I mean, it's still clear that to this very day, she's still going to have more character development as the story continues. But anyways, Ruby is another example of a great female protagonist, not just because of how different she is from her brother Aqua, but also just her viewpoints in the story overall. Ruby wasn't always like this. In her previous life, she always had her entire life just simply being in a hospital because of her illness. And when she passed away, she would come to find out that she was the daughter of the idol that she was a huge fan of. But upon the tragedy of Ai Hoshino, Ruby's life would really take a nosedive. But even though she never really forgot about what happened to her mother, she was determined to follow her mother's footsteps into becoming an idol. And this despite Alka being against it, this was her dream all this entire time. This was something that she always dreamed of in her previous life, but now she wanted to make it happen even more because of I. But of course, Ruby was still very young and she still was very inexperienced to the idol industry as well as the entertainment industry, which is why it was very clear that characters like Aqua and Kano were trying to give her as much information about what really happens in these industries in order for Ruby to realize that this path in life isn't going to be easy. And even though Ruby knew this from the start, it Experiencing it was a different story because Ruby would experience just how hard this industry is But despite the hardships Ruby was still positive and tried to always move forward That is until she found out about the doctor from her previous life being killed and here we see Ruby have darkness inside of her Similar to how Aqua has as because of this news She is now determined to find out who was responsible for the doctor's death and kill them by their own hands Because this person meant a lot to Ruby in her previous life because because this doctor was always very supportive of her during her difficult times but while all this is happening Ruby is also having her inner struggles as she feels like she can't be as perfect like her mother she wonders if she could be just as her mother can she be as talented and as great as I was and despite her trying her hardest she always feels like it's not enough it feels like she always has to improve no matter what and I think that's what really makes Ruby such a very interesting female protagonist as she too isn't perfect but at the same time she has also shown that she could actually have a darkness inside of her just like Aqua has as well. And like I mentioned earlier, she's still developing so there's not really too much to say as she's most likely going to become more and more interesting as the story continues. I just wanted to make this because I feel like not a lot of people are talking about the female protagonist in anime series which is a real shame but I hope this really just proves how if done right a female protagonist can be just as good as the protagonist of that series. Hopefully in the near future there there's more manga series and anime series that do have more female protagonists, but we'll just have to wait and see. And yeah, that's about it. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you next time.